Hello everyone and welcome back to AMOS, our course on Agile methods and open source software. So in the first two sessions of this course, we looked at the tools and the basic process. The tools, GitHub, the planning documents and so forth, and the process, Scrum, adjusted to a university environment. We noticed how Scrum as a framework needed to be instantiated and how the challenges of performing communication and coordination in software development at a university or in a university course are quite hard or can be quite hard equally, if not harder than an in industry. Before I get to today's lecture, please be reminded one more time about properly signing off your commits on GitHub and declaring your co-authors, if there are any, if you're pair programming. How to do so? Please see the previous slides. Also, commonly done wrong, during review, you should show and tell, not just tell. It's important that the release manager uh, makes sure there's a good build and that you can demo your work off that build rather than just talking about it. Finally, don't forget your sprint preparation meeting. The product owners should sit down before the team meeting, make sure the product backlog is well groomed and if necessary, draw on a developer to make sure that the product backlog entries make sense from an engineering perspective, are not too vague, are not too large, etc. So today then, uh, we will take a step back. The first two sessions showed you how to get started with Amos, how to run Scrum for a university student project and so forth. Now, as we take a step back, we want to understand how Scrum came about. So we will look at software engineering, software development processes, specifically plan-driven development, uh, sometimes also known as waterfall, and then how it motivated the emergence of Scrum of Agile methods and then Scrum in particular. So software development uh, is why you're here for and I need to get a few basic things uh, in place that are often confused. The first one and that extends to Scrum as well is to be clear whether you are talking about a product or a project. A product is something that you sell, so it's developed for a market and has many customers. That's the idea. A product has a life cycle. It's born at some point of time, but the key is it may live on forever, for better or worse. There's no implication uh, out of necessity that it will come to an end. It might, and it might be planned, but it's not a characteristic element that a product has a defined end. A project, however, is exactly defined by that. It's something that you do from starting with a start date and ending with an end date. A project has a time limit on it, a start and an end date. And in software development, a project is typically what you do for one particular customer, one client. So the difference extends all the way to the types of companies who do these types of uh, products or projects. Products are done by a vendor or software product company and projects are done by consulting or implementation companies which uh, do one-off projects for clients. It's really quite fundamental that you understand this difference because there's just a huge misuse of the term project. Everything somehow is a project. And that is at least terminologic, terminologically not correct. And since this confusion continues into Scrum, we need to think hard about when we do Scrum for products or projects, and when we are talking about products, even though our Scrum calls a project. So in a traditional software development organization, um, which a consulting firm, for example, uh, which does projects, then you would have a project manager and then folks working for that project manager in that project, say software developers. The project manager has supervisory authority over the software developers, can tell them what to do more or less. So it's a simple hierarchy 
a project manager um, who knows what needs doing, tells the developers what to do, and that's how you execute the project. The project manager is responsible for planning, managing, and delivering the project results to clients. Again, there's an end date, and that will hopefully come with the project results for that one client who is paying for the project work, effectively paying for the salaries of the people involved, uh, presumably with a nice markup. The software developers and such a project team, so obviously project team are obviously responsible for implementing whatever the project manager wants project manager wants them to do. Contrast a project company, a consulting company, with a product company, also called a vendor or software vendor, if you're talking about software. There you have a different uh, positions, different roles and responsibilities associated with these positions. You have the engineering manager uh, who is responsible for coordinating software developers uh, to do the implementation work for the software product. Because there is no single client, but rather you're developing for a market with many customers in there, you don't have a project manager, you have a product manager and it's the product manager's job to understand what the market wants. Uh, typically, the commonality of what the different, uh, the common ground of what different customers in the market want. Key challenge of a product manager is to figure out what is, every, what is it that everyone wants and that gets highly prioritized versus what just one particular customer wants, which would not be so important because you're always trying to sell to as many customers as possible. And then separately from the engineering manager in a traditional software organization, you will have a quality assurance manager whose job it is to make sure that the software meets the expectations or the requirements set forth by the product manager. Engineering manager and quality assurance manager are really technical managers who will manage, supervise uh, people to do the jobs that are given to them. The engineering manager supervises software developers, the quality assurance manager supervises quality assurance engineers. They do testing, analysis, etc., but not product development. So here again, the product manager knows what needs doing uh, for customers in the market. The engineering manager uh, knows who could do the different things, so they assign tasks uh, and also uh, order them so they know who has to do gets to do what or they're responsible for telling people what to do and when the software developer is obviously responsible to actually do the job and often they help with estimating how long it might take and similarly a quality assurance engineer is uh, responsible for testing and providing feedback that uh, the product meets the expectations the requirements Software developed uh, for a market, meaning a product, not a project. A product typically has a life cycle of an initial release, so arguably the birth date or the start date. Continued development, meaning extensions, new functionality, and then often a maintenance phase as it's dying slowly but surely, not always but usually, where well, there are only small fixes. Whether there is much sense in distinguishing between continued development and maintenance, I leave up to you. Um, from an engineering perspective, it's not always the case that you would think there's a big difference, but they're usually confounding factors like uh, taxation, which will want you to be clear whether it's regular ongoing development or maintenance could make a big difference to the taxes a company pays. Also, you probably heard that in your general software engineering course, when you think about software development projects or products, um, you can think about the management using this so-called magic triangle. It's magic because if you pick two of the three factors here, scope, time, and quality, if you pick two, the third is already settled. So picking two determines the third. 
you can see there's a fourth factor in the middle of it. So in addition to scope, time and quality of software, you also have cost of developing it. Cost is usually assumed uh, constant. Do you know why? Cost in software development is usually the salaries of people. And we know that changes to a team of people which is developing software are costly in terms of delays. So ideally, there are no changes in a team. It gets together, it does the job, and then if it was a project, it moves on. And hence, the number of people is which who it is is stable, cost is fixed, and based on top of that, you can then argue about scope, time, and quality. If, for example, so scope means uh, what is it? The features, the functionality. Time means typically deadlines. By when do you need to have these functions? And if you say settle by the end of the year, we need these 15 functions or features. Then given the fixed cost, the fixed team, um, the quality is determined. You know, if, that, if it's a lot of features, quality will be low because you don't really have enough time. If it's not that many features and you have plenty of time, well, the quality will go up. So quality depends on scope and time. If you have a fixed quality, so um, you insist on substantial test coverage and so forth and are given a deadline, well, maintaining that quality, you keep developing and what you get done by the deadline, well, that's the features. So the features follow from the time if a deadline is set and the quality must be maintained and so forth. That's the idea of the magic triangle. So after these basics of software development, let's look at the initial idea that the industry had of how to develop uh, software. Um, there were many different names for different approaches, but they all fall from today's perspective. The term plan driven development was invented after the fact. They all fall into this particular category plan driven development, because the idea is that uh, in order to achieve, um, make sure you achieve what you set out to do, you need to plan rigorously. And only if you think things through rigorously and spend the appropriate amount of time on planning, will you actually achieve your goals. Achieving your goals is quite relevant because it means typically, as you promise, say in a project, as you promise your customer that you deliver something by a certain date, you want to be sure that you do that. And time and again, it has actually not worked out. So it's a common for software development projects uh, to fail despite a lot of planning. But let me return to the basics of plan driven development. The fundamental idea is that you start the project or the iteration or the release of a product um, by planning what you want to do, then do it and in the end release. No surprises. That's like what you already learned about Scrum. But the overall duration of these different activities or phases here can be very long. So the traditional approach to projects has been, oh, it's a, at least a two year project. So let's spend the first uh, four months on planning and then we'll do it. And then we'll do one month of review and release at the end. So one, two, three, and you're done. You are thinking you are done if you only planned hard enough. Of course, that is questionable. I don't know what how much experience you have with planning exactly and not having to revise anything. But in the past, people would plan for two years, even five years, uh, get contracts in place that then promised what the plan said they would achieve in writing and was surprised when at the end, in a large number of cases, it was not achieved what had been promised. 
or if it had been achieved, also often the case, five years later, the world had changed so dramatically that what was planned five years ago uh, was totally irrelevant uh, to today. So let me show you a video here um, from a um, Hollywood movie, The Pentagon Wars. And um, you will find it on YouTube. Since you're watching a video, I ask you to head over there because I won't play it here. But you can play it on YouTube if you don't know it already and then come back here. I'll still be here. No, yeah, I'm serious. Head over there. I'll be waiting here for you. And uh, watch it. It's 10 minutes, but it's quite funny. And there are lots and lots of lessons for projects and products in there. <laughs> watched the video on YouTube or at least know it already. So let me move forward here. And uh, the lessons from the video are these here. What you saw were multiple stakeholders with conflicting interests. You had the Navy, the Army and the Air Force. Uh, so they had different interests, generals from these different branches of the military had different interests, sometimes conflicting interests. Um, you had the uh, defense contractor who has its own interests and they were always meddling. What it meant to the uh, undertaking of developing this new uh, tank, which was, was, was initially arguably a project, is that the requirements um, kept changing. It's called feature creep. Uh, the requirements, you think they are given, they are clear and it would be easy to work to them. But next meeting with your customers, in this case, the generals, they change them, which uh, makes the focus change. You have to rework, you have to stop what you're doing, etc. Feature creep also means the focus or the um, orientation uh, and what this all is about changes as well. So suddenly, uh, what was supposed to be a troop carrier became a full-blown tank which could fire the enemy and what have you. Not to mention that what was meant for the US uh, Army suddenly uh, was considered for being sold off to other countries as well. So was that a project? Uh, is that a product? Is that a product for the US market? Is that a product for uh, the world? And as a consequence of all of this, uh, the costs exploded, you know, much to the annoyance of the stakeholders, but they were meddling. They were even uh, at fault for this year, arguably. So it's really hard being a project manager. Uh, the, the requirements, uh, what needs doing, can be really hard to understand. Let me summarize again. It can change over time because the world keeps changing or your customers won't change. Uh, it's also that you don't even necessarily understand them properly from the beginning. You're only learning. So you don't understand the requirements and they keep changing because the world keeps changing. Put that into the framework of plan driven software development where you would start out with planning and then do something for five years only to look back and see, well, the world has changed. We developed something that's not really needed any longer. And by the way, we misunderstood half of the requirements anyway and did uh, the wrong thing. In response to this problem, um, software engineering researchers and industry decided not to do something fundamental about it. They just hunkered down. They decided to get more specific, meaning not only would they do planning, they would do multiple types of planning. They would get more formal. They would get more rigorous. They would get more detailed. It's not just planning, execution and release. It is in one case you're looking at here. First develop system requirements, then develop software requirements, then perform domain analysis, then design the system and the architecture 
only then start programming and after that only then start testing and maybe hopefully after that put things into operations. So many more steps with many more techniques were the initial answer. And the author, uh, the person who coined the term the waterfall model as a development process most closely aligned with the notion of plan-driven development, described it and already noted that, well, you can't really, can't really take this stepwise one, two, three, and so forth. No, the water is not just flowing down the waterfall like here. You have to go back to previous steps. You have to realize, or Royce, the author here, realized in his industry work that during program design, while designing the system, there were issues with the requirements. The requirements were imprecise. They had gaping, gaping holes and that needed fixing. So you needed to go back to the software requirements to fill those holes, get more specific, and only then through analysis return to program design. So suddenly there was a loop in the process. The sequence of steps went back from program design to software requirements and domain analysis and back to program design. Or during testing, you would recognize that certain non-functional requirements, say about system performance, could just not be met. And hence you had to go back to the design and change it. So from program design through coding and testing and testing you realize bugs or not meeting requirements and you had to go back to program design, etc. So another loop in all of these activity in all of these steps. And perhaps the fundamental thing to realize what's wrong here with plan driven development was the confusion of phases with activities. An activity is some task you do and for which you have tools and methods and so forth. It was an important recognition in software development that you can separate the uh, activity of analyzing an application domain to understand what users or customers are doing, that you can separate this activity and have your own tools and methods and practices for it and separate that from programming. Programming is a different activity with its own set of tools and methods and practices. Plan-driven development then took these activities, analyzing, designing, programming, testing, took these activities and made the often wrong assumption that you need to perform these activities in always this one order First analysis, then design, then programming, then testing. Always in this order and only once and then you're done. And that's just not real life. The first thing to observe is we had these loops. Even the author of the waterfall model, Royce, recognized you have to go back. You have to do things over. And uh, even though there seems to be some logic to, well, uh, design only after analysis. Because of these loops, you actually do analysis after you design something. So there's an interaction between uh, these activities as you cycle potentially through them. This is not to say that it's impossible to have a, let's say, a project where you go through these activities in a particular order, analyzing, designing, programming, testing, exactly once and you're done. Small projects are possibly approachable like that. A lot of master theses or final theses are sufficiently small that an experienced professor or research assistant can simply lay out a plan for you like it and then you just do it. But anything more complex is unlikely for you to uh, be successful with coming up a single plan first where you then just walk through these activities once. And that brought about Agile methods.
So agile methods are the response to plan-driven software development, uh, not really uh, working so well in practice as projects got uh, larger and more uncertain. Agile methods then arguably are a category of software development uh, methodologies, the other one being plan-driven development, I would argue inner source software development, which I'm not uh, addressing in this course, is a third one. And agile methods were defined in opposition to plan-driven development, so they came about much later. Plan-driven development dominated most of the 70s as yeah, software development got into full swing, 80s, 90s, and agile methods came about in the mid-90s and uh, after initial resistance kept growing like wildfire, which is why today mostly we have agile methods and then a particular instance of it called Scrum. I, since I was there, I can report for better or worse that uh, there was a lot of uh, oopla and talking and grandstanding because agile software development was a fabulous consulting opportunity to focus in the domain. So there's a lot of nonsense being said and written for the pure purpose of getting a consultant or some idea on the map and having them, uh, helping them sell their ideas. But the key idea of Agile is valid and it is to have a fast feedback loop so that you can react to changes that you can learn incrementally, etc. So arguably you don't plan, rather you steer in response to what's going on. One of the um, inventors of one of the methods, extreme programming, Ken Beck, liked it, likened it to uh, driving. Yeah? You keep driving a particular road and you react to what's happening on the road. So you're steering, you're reacting. Uh, you have both a plan, you have a goal, but you're doing involves a lot of context-specific flexible reaction. The underlying principles of Agile methods were codified as the Agile Manifesto, which is actually uh, quite an achievement in how it frames uh, what is Agile quite nicely. So here are the learnings from the, or the, the key statements from the Agile Manifesto, which is still on the web. You can look it up yourself if you like. And these are that there is a preference of individuals and interactions in software. There should be a preference of individuals and interactions in software development over processes and tools. What it means is that if you want to be agile or those who argue you should be agile, argue individuals and so people and how they collaborate um, are more important than following strict processes and establishing tools. It doesn't mean processes and tools aren't important, but the people and how they interact, that's more important. That's more important to being successful. So you should support that, emphasize that more than processes and tools. You should also focus more on working software over comprehensive documentation. So if in Amos I'm telling you that during review you need to show working software, demo your software, that's exactly that. Don't talk about it. Don't say I wrote a document that explains uh, what the software is doing. Show the software, right? Working, prefer working software over comprehensive documentation because it makes the feedback cycle much better. So also collaborate with your customer, you know, show them the working software and learn from the customer. Uh, they will be much more responsive. You will get much more information if they can point to the screen and tell you, no, that's not right. And here's something missing in terms of the data structure and what have you. And no, I wouldn't take that next step. So why can't I do this? Um, work with your customer over time in repeated feedback sessions so that you can steer and adjust what you're doing. And this should be emphasized over negotiating a contract which contains deliverables that are due at some future point of time. 
So collaborate with your customer rather than having a one-shot contract uh, that may or may not be what the customer actually wants. And then use all of that to flexibly respond to what you're learning and change. Yeah? So change what you are doing as you're learning new things, which includes the change in the world. So the world um, suddenly has new requirements, the tax laws changed or some other law changed or the competitive landscape for a company changed. Um, as that happens, your plans need to adjust and what you're going to do needs to adjust and that is much better to flexibly react and change direction than blindly following an original plan that is long out of date. In more practical terms, these fundamental principles have led to a software development process that has been split up into a large number and sequence of small time boxes, which in Scrum you know as sprints, your one week sprints in the Amos project. So these time boxes or iterations are the original five years, arguably, of a plan-driven software development. But because you really want to not have one iteration, one shot at delivering what the customer wants, but many, you make them really small. So you have an iteration or time box or sprint length of one week or two weeks or four weeks, in which you go through a full cycle of planning what you want to do, doing it, and then reviewing it. Within one time box, hence, you are not interrupted by the outside world. You do what you planned. But the time box is so small, so short, that you finish it quickly. And during review, you learn how the world has changed and how your plans need to change accordingly, because next you will start the new next time box in which what you learned will affect your planning. So in agile software development, you have short time boxes which provide you defined intervention points by customers, the real world, change in the real world uh, during review and then affect planning and allow you to steer in response to what is changing. You get all the feedback you need to steer in the right direction uh, during review and release. You don't let it randomly change your plans during a time box. But you do take the feedback and the information you get into account in the next planning session. So yes, you hunker down for a time box, for a sprint, for an iteration of maybe a week, in the Amos case, or two weeks more common in industry and only change plans or do the new planning after you finished an iteration. So you get the feedback of whether you actually are helping your customers uh, within after a time box that's now, let's say, two weeks. So after an iteration, that's two weeks, rather than learning after five years that what you delivered is no good. These short, much shorter iterations uh, have a couple of consequences. Um, they uh, make you focus on what's most valuable to your customer first because your customer gets to see or the product manager in case of a, of a product for a market or the customer itself, the client itself in case of a project for that client. They get to see what you did uh, after two weeks. So you want to show progress, you focus on what's most important to them rather than well, taking care of what you would like to do because it's years from now that the customer even will take a look. So you focus always on high value features or highest value features first and you establish this work rhythm or you need actually a well working work rhythm that is sustainable. Um, in order to regularly deliver when the time box over something to your, uh, to your customers. Even if the functionality is only partial, you can show something. It's much better than none. The user then, 
as they engage with you, customer collaboration, as they engage with you, provide that information or feedback that you need to steer the project right. And they do so on regular intervals at the end of the time box or at some defined point of time. And this regular feedback makes sure that any problems surface early, that any significant changes that would make some old plan obsolete are brought into the project or product development in time and so forth. So it really makes sure you're steering, you're adjusting how you're doing things on the fly, but in a defined way. You can see an illustration of this here. In the case of plan-driven software development, let's say the software is in state S1 at the beginning and after five years uh, for which you carried out a plan-driven development um, uh, 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 process, uh, you reached what the initial set goal was in location T1. But uh, each year the world changed and the needs changed. So you can see how T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, uh, where the software should be moved away from where it was five years ago when the planning took place. And the state S5 after five years is quite far from where it should be T5. Assume that uh, you're performing agile development and uh, you have intermittent reviews. You have time boxes that are not five years, but let's say one year or much shorter. And you plan the software that is in state S1 for target T1, but after a much shorter iterations after one year where you're in state S2 on your way to T1, you realize things shifted to T2. So you replan and you orient yourself towards T2 and take another step towards state S3 where you realize, oh well, it's moved on to T3. You take another step towards T3, so you replan again, take another step and so, and so forth. And you can see how while the world keeps running away from you. You are with shorter feedback cycles in state S5 at the end, much closer to your target state T5 in the agile, in the adjusting, plan adjusted uh, process than you are in the plan driven development to the left. This type of readjustments to changes in the world, to changes uh, in your understanding of what needs doing will get you much closer to happy or satisfied customers or product managers. Another consequence of uh, agile planning or agile methods is that your work as a developer, mostly, but also as a product manager changes. Maybe you don't like it, but in plan driven development, when you had a time horizon of two years or five years, uh, where you wouldn't see your customers. You would have a convenient life in the beginning. After all, the delivery deadline is two years, five years out. So life is good, you work uh, reasonable hours and that's it. Eventually you'll notice how you need to speed up because kind of falling behind, everything's more complicated than expected and you run into crunch time close to delivery, right? I think every student has experienced how you ignore the looming deadline for some project deliverable, the semester paper or so, and only start working really hard as the time to deliver it draws nearer. So um, you go from good life to really hard and harsh crunch time life. That's the upper uh, illustration. In Agile Methods, because there's a review much more frequently, um, you have much lower amplitude in terms of relaxing or working hard because you have to deliver much faster. You wouldn't be able to sustain a high crunch time like in long iterations with plan driven methods. Shorter iterations make sure that you work at a much more steady pace, which arguably is also more sustainable and certainly more healthy to you because you never have this at least in theory, never have this really, really bad crunch time that plan-driven methods give you, where 
the uh, income of a five-year project is at stake if the software doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And while people who don't know better may not agree, but then they don't know, Agile methods, because of all the practices that you're learning in this course, for example, are high discipline. They are not cowboy coding. Just because you recognize that you can't plan everything in advance doesn't make you a cowboy coder. It's quite the opposite. Agile methods force you into a work and delivery rhythm. It's very disciplined. It's also better for your health, typically, um, but it's highly disciplined. So much so that some developers hate Agile methods because of that. They want more freedom, but Agile methods is not giving it to them. Now then, after the basics of why we got Agile methods in response to plan-driven development, we got this boom in consultants inventing their own methods, specific Agile methods, all on these fundamental principles from the Agile Manifesto. And after the uh, corresponding shootout, there's really one specific Agile method left called Scrum, as you know, the one we're using in this course. So Scrum is a particular Agile method uh, invented in the early mid 90s with a minimal Agile process model. Interestingly enough, if you read the Scrum guide, uh, where it's being described, it's actually very general. It's not just for software development. It could be used in other domains as well. Interestingly enough, it really has stuck though only in software development and not in, let's say, uh, logistics planning or PR agencies. It's really strong in software and only in software. The uh, documentation of Scrum is by way of the Scrum Guide, there are many versions. It gets updated and it gets improved. It's still, it is a short document, deliberately so. You should probably read it, but I should warn you that it's a lot of industry slang without term definitions, which of course uh, ruffles my feathers. They should be more precise, but um, that's of course what you get from consultants who also need to sell their consulting hours. So Scrum relies on three main roles that people get to play. You know them. It's the Scrum Master, it's the Product Owner and the Software Developer. These are roles. So multiple people, uh, many people can play these roles uh, since it's roles in theory. Uh, one person can play multiple roles, though I'm not sure it's advisable to have a Software Developer also be a Scrum Master or a Product Owner. But sometimes it happens and even happens in the Amos project if, for example, a software developer steps up and takes over the part of the Product Owner role at times. In Amos, we have one Scrum Master, two Product Owners and six software developers in the default team, which with nine people is a comparatively large team. Most Scrum teams are smaller. These three core roles are called the committed roles. So product owner, software developer, scrum master, the committed roles. There are other roles, uh, there are customers, there are funders, uh, like an entrepreneur funding a company, there may be regulators, etc. but they are only involved. They are not committed to the project or product being developed. I don't particularly find it so funny, but uh, there is a joke that comes with it to help you remember the difference between committed and involved roles, part of Scrum lore, and it's about the chicken and the pig uh, who are friends, and the chicken says to the pig, uh, how about we start a restaurant business? I'll provide the eggs and you'll provide the ham. And the pig, smart as it is, answers, no, 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 you would only be involved, I would be committed because I'd be losing my legs. That's the difference between being committed, it's really serious for you, versus it only touches you, you're only involved. 
The uh, roles that Scrum defines are really roles that get assigned to people. And if you go out, uh, if you leave, finish university and go into industry, you will actually still find traditional line organizations where you have an engineering manager who's an engineer who's a manager of more engineering managers so maybe they are a director or vice president of engineering and have a hierarchy where the software developers are the leaves of the hierarchy being told by the managers what to do and if they decide to go agile they still have that line reporting relationship but they overlay it with the roles where the software developers by position pick up the scrum role of software developer and where a product manager for example picks up the PO role and um, or quite frankly sometimes the engineering manager picks up the PO role because uh, the detailed technical features etc that you would find in a product backlog are often too technical for traditional business-minded product managers. So in any case, you take these roles and they coexist from the line reporting hierarchy inside companies, who's your boss, and you assign the roles or companies assign the roles to the people they put somehow into the hierarchy. And then the project work or the product development work takes place based on these roles. Still performance evaluation and having a career and all of that uh, takes place in the line reporting hierarchy. These mappings or the correspondence to positions uh, depend again on whether you are a consulting firm or a software vendor. The product owner role of Scrum, if it's a project, is typically picked up by the project manager. If it's a software product, you would think it's the product manager, uh, but often it's also the engineering manager, because again, a product manager who is strategic often doesn't have the technical knowledge to get more detailed. And so an engineering manager has to fill in. Software developers are usually software developers. Sometimes for a consulting firm, the project manager helps in implementation and at a vendor, the software developers really, they are um, uh, the regular developers, but they also take, uh, they are also involved in quality assurance and so forth. The Scrum Master in a consulting project is most certainly the project manager responsible for process and improvement, process improvement, and same thing for the engineering manager who uh, uh, takes care of, of process improvement. You may have separately employed people of course purely for the role of scrum master also reporting to an engineering manager if they don't want to do it or can't do it and if um, agile is taking a stronger hold but um, that's not always the case yeah so there's a lot in scrum where they are very confused or the authors are confused about what's a project what's a product Scrum is used for both performing projects for a client and performing product development at a vendor, products for a market. But the term product owner only has the term product in there. Uh, in a custom project for a client, the product owner corresponds most to what's traditionally be called a business analyst, a requirements engineer or if it's product development, a product manager. In Scrum, there's something called a product, uh, product goal. Uh, why are we even doing this? And a project, because it has a time limit, a time and end date, doesn't really have such a big vision. So at best, there's a mission uh, to, to a project. But um, you know, that's different for a product, which is long lived, where there is a vision beyond a short-term time-bound mission. The product vision is how the world will be a better place because of that product. Then there's a product backlog. That's the requirement specification in a custom project and the product requirements document. That's a somewhat ancient term by now, but still the only term I'm aware of here at the software vendor. The product backlog basically replaces those if you're actually going to do um, uh, Scrum 
at a product vendor, then there's no PRD. Um, if you're doing custom projects where you actually still do an upfront requirement specification, well, then you have that requirement specification that Pflichten heft for the company and even if it is turned into a product backlog later. Scrum then only talks about time boxes of the duration of a sprint, one to four weeks. So Scrum has a time horizon of day and a sprint uh, measured in weeks, one week, two weeks, four weeks. Beyond these comparatively short time horizons, as you want to do planning, I argue that Scrum somehow implies that there are releases beyond the sprint release. So in Amos, these are the mid-project release and the final release. And so we have something like series releases and finished projects and finished or main iterations, main releases, major version number changes in a product. Beyond those extended time horizons, you can already have really a product life cycle where you reason about the birth of a project, of a product, I wanted to say, its development phase, its extension phase, its maintenance and its final sun setting. And you can also go across to that and talk about the portfolio of multiple products in parallel. So you have a scope or time horizon even larger than that. And you can see that all of these, one, two, uh, six, are dimensions, a scope that you need to cover as you work maybe for a large company. The first one, uh, the day time horizon is defined because you have a daily scrum or a daily stand up uh, according to scrum. It's that daily status meeting where you sync on your problems and you talk about upcoming work and so forth. And the idea is it's short. It's really just informational. Everyone does, says what they are doing. So what you did, what you're going to do, what the problems that you're expecting are or that you're having are. And then you break. And if there was something that piqued your interest, you talk to that person after the meeting. You don't start a debate during the meeting. For a daily scrum, you need the committed parties. They must be there. Everyone else is optional. They're also not allowed. The, the optional people, meaning the involved parties, say funder, customer, they are not allowed to talk usually. And so um, that's what you do once a day or on those days at which you work in the Amos project. And as you know, you use the happiness index tool. One of its two functions, you use the daily stand up email function to communicate with your team and to perform your daily scrum this way, this way. In real life, if you actually co-located even in the same office, you would often stand in a circle like this, do the rounds and then break. You can also force people to do it more quickly by doing a daily plank and everyone will be happy and make sure be most people will want to be done quickly if they have to plank during the meeting. The Scrum Sprint, so past the day, we now have a time box uh, called Sprint in Scrum. And it's that uh, well, time box with a defined duration. And the key is the next time box has the same duration so that all that planning uh, becomes doable because all these iterations you're going to have are of the same size and on the same duration, the same length. And so as long as the team doesn't change, you would expect that you can get roughly the same amount of work done each uh, sprint. The proportions are like this. It's probably still not enough time for execution when you have a short planning meeting or you have a planning meeting. Most of the time in a given sprint is spent on execution. And at the end, you have the review, release, and retrospective processes or practices. Scrum here talks about the increment of value that a sprint is supposed to deliver. So you only do sprints, or as you go into a sprint, you think ahead 
of what that particular time box is supposed to deliver in terms of value to a customer. Value I, is of course a very generic term. It's arguably then also industry lingo. It really means uh, something useful to customers, useful functionality. And ideally it's not just a hodgepodge of this or that, but it's somehow cohesive. So you often have multiple features that pull together and thereby create a larger increment of value uh, that, uh, that you provide to your users. And that increment of value is realized by that sprint release, hopefully, that you get done at the end of the sprint. You know the sprint structure. Again, this is Scrum. Logically, it starts with a sprint planning meeting and it ends with a re review, release and retrospective has daily scrums or daily stand-ups for coordination. And of course, there's a next sprint preparation meeting to make sure that sprint planning at the start of the next sprint works out well. Uh, as you also know, our Amos team meeting puts review, release, retrospective and sprint planning together. You can see here that I marked sprint planning to start on Wednesday morning and end on Tuesday evening. Well, so we move it into Wednesday afternoon. So it's not the break from Tuesday to Wednesday. And it's even recommended that even if you are full time on it and you don't have to do everything in one team meeting, but rather indeed review, release and retrospective is before sprint planning, possibly on the previous day as you do that you don't do it over the weekend. You want to not miss a beat as you finish the old sprint and go into the new sprint. Uh, the, the knee jerk reaction would usually be let's start planning Monday morning and finish on Friday afternoon. But then the learnings from the review, release and retrospective will not directly feed into sprint planning, but there's the weekend in between. So the recommendation is to have those close by and not do it uh, using and not put it into weak boundaries. Here again is the key um, meeting, the IMOS team meeting with review, release, retrospective and planning and the run up meeting, the sprint preparation meeting and afterwards the daily scrums that you perform. During the execution part, so after planning and before review and release, you perform the actual work. I call it work streams here. It's a common term. And you have the three main work streams based on the different roles that people play. Product management, software development and process improvement. And well, you already know it, I guess. The product owner builds and grooms the product backlog, is available for questions by developers as to what that actually is they're supposed to develop. The developers do just that. They pick items from the sprint backlog and uh, get cracking on these items, do the development work and so forth. They have questions they can go to the product owner and ask. The Scrum Master in parallel works First of all, observers of, observes, of course, the work and to possibly notif notice problems and respond to those. And, uh, but in general works on what they last learned during the last retrospective about current problems, issues the team is facing, tries to resolve them, tries to find ways of making them more effective, improving the process. So then, um, this was the basics of uh, plan-driven versus agile methods and then how Scrum works and why we have agile methods in Scrum. In the next session, we will have the build process review. It's still early in the project, though I hope you are already up and running and doing well and having fun. But what I want of you in the next class is to demo that you have a well working build. I expect that uh, it's possible for every developer in a project to build the system. So perform a clone from the GitHub repository and trigger 
trigger the build. If you're using continuous integration on, uh, on your project, then you will have to use an empty commit or something that triggers the, uh, triggers the build there and you can explain it. So ideally then also, uh, well, the build certainly then, even if it's in the cloud, obviously is independent of a machine, but whichever your setup, it shouldn't depend on the particular person's machine. So an argument like, yeah, but it works for this other person um, is not, not acceptable. So I will call on you to demo that. I expect every developer to be able to do that. Uh, if you worry about it, feel free to talk to your colleagues, help each other uh, understand what it is, how it works, so you can answer any questions I might have. And that's it. Uh, we talked about development processes and I very much look forward to your build process review, build process demos in the next session. Thank you very much and see you soon.